Uh, this evening we're going to be looking at a very familiar passage of Scripture. It's uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And if you haven't already, I would encourage you to memorize these two verses. Um, full of wonderful truth and something that we really need to understand and apply uh, if we are going to, um, well, not only be fruitful, but also have um, uh, the kind of life we would hope to have in this world, uh, obtain, as it were, the happiness uh, as we trust that the Lord is in control of all the things going on in our lives. Let me just uh, read these two verses, and then we'll look at them for a few moments. Solomon writes, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. And may the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now again, this morning, we, we saw that uh, the, the miracle that Jesus did, that one miracle that's recorded in all four gospels and that was feeding the 5,000 with the five loaves and the two fish. Uh, a miracle which we saw proved uh, to those who were fed and was meant to prove to us as well that Jesus is in fact the Messiah, he is the bread of life, uh, he is the one who alone can save us and we do need to trust him, we need to look to him in faith, we need to turn from our sins and we need to receive him as our Lord and our Savior. But I would just remind you that before Jesus did this miracle uh, he tested Philip by asking him where they could buy bread in order to feed this crowd. Remember that Jesus had uh, ministered to them. He had taught them. He had healed them. It was already late. It was perhaps too late to send them away to find food. And so Jesus didn't want them to go away. He wanted to feed them. So he asked Philip. Philip was from Bethsaida. That's where they were. Philip, where can we buy bread for all of these? And Philip is looking around trying to think, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? Well, Philip, as you know, failed that particular test because rather than looking to Jesus and trusting him to take care of that need, instead he looked to his own resources and came up short because there was no way that he was going to be able to do it or the disciples. Now, we need to realize that as we read these accounts of the failures of the disciples, that they're not alone in, uh, in these shortcomings, in these weaknesses, because how often do we find ourselves doing exactly the same thing that Philip did? The Lord asks us to believe something, and we find ourselves struggling uh, to do that. Uh, he takes us down a path that seems maybe too dangerous or too difficult, and we hesitate. Uh, he brings things into our lives that are uh, hard to deal with, and we crumble under the pressure. We pray that the Lord would, would bless us spiritually, that he would draw us near to himself, that he would do a greater work in our lives and make us more useful to him, as he promised that he would. And suddenly it seems as though everything begins to move in the opposite direction. Everything turns against us. And we so quickly want to give up. Now when this happens, I mean, aren't we falling into the same snare that Philip fell into? Aren't we... Uh, looking to our own abilities, uh, to our own assessment and understanding of the situation, aren't we also losing sight of God and falling into unbelief? Now, Solomon, even as far back as the Old Covenant, knew what it is that we should do with regard to the promises of God. We do need to trust him that the Lord knows what he's doing in all these different circumstances and that God will in fact fulfill his promise to work everything that we have to face, everything he brings into our lives together for our good if we will simply love him and trust him. This evening I want us to consider four things from this passage, it kind of divides itself neatly into four different categories. There's three, basically three commands and one promise. First, that we should trust in the Lord with, with all of our hearts. That we should not lean on our own understanding. That we should acknowledge the Lord in all of our ways. And then the promise that if we do these things, He will make our paths straight. So let's look at these four things this evening and I'm hoping they will not only be enlightening to us but also an encouragement to us. First of all, Solomon writes, 
in verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your hearts. And from this particular statement, I want us to see really uh, three things. First of all, I want us to remember, first of all, whom it is that we are to trust, who this one is, the Lord. Now, if Solomon had said, trust man with all your heart, that would have been difficult to do because we know what the character of man is like, even the best of them. Jeremiah writes in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? And you know, Jeremiah doesn't even distinguish between those who are the Lord's and those who are not because the fact is we all have sin in our hearts. We can't even trust ourselves, let alone others, and I don't want to say absolutely because certainly we are to trust our brothers and sisters in the Lord, but really all of us are prone to failure and all of us are going to let each other down, but there is one who doesn't let us down, and that is the Lord. Solomon doesn't say trust in man. He says trust the Lord. Uh, the Lord, as you know, is different uh, than we are. He has a much better character. The Bible says that the Lord is good. The psalmist writes in Psalm 135, verse 3, Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to His name, for it is lovely. We know from Scripture that the Lord is holy, which means that He basically has a perfect love for everything that is right and everything that is good. We read in 1 Peter 1, verses 14 through 16, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. And because this is the character of God, that God is good, and that God loves with a perfect love everything that is good, that He is holy, we know that when God speaks that He is always going to tell us only that, which is true. He's never going to deceive us. Now, Balaam in Numbers 23, 19, uh, when he was basically prophesying over Israel, uh, Balak, as you know, hired him to curse Israel, but every time he offered the offerings and every time he prophesied, nothing came out but blessings. He says this regarding God, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? Notice God here being contrasted with man because the nature of man is, is so different than that of God since the fall. Will God make it good? If he says it, he will do it. He will make it good not only because he is good, not only because it's his nature not to deceive and not to lie to us, but because he also has the ability to do everything that he promises. Jeremiah writes in Jeremiah 32, 17, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power, and by your outstretched arm, nothing is too difficult for you. So here we have one who is good, one who is holy, one who cannot lie, one who cannot deceive, and one who has the power to do all that he has promised. How can you not trust someone like this? You'll never find anyone more faithful. So we are to trust the Lord. Secondly, knowing that the Lord is trustworthy, again, the commandment is to Trust Him. Now, again, you need to trust His character. You need to know He's not going to lead you astray, as we've already seen. You need to trust His power. You need to believe that He is able to do what He promises. But you also need to trust that God, uh, well, He knows what is best for you. And that He's going to do what is best for you. As He says in His Word, He actually will. Now, here's where we kind of begin to get into what it is we need to understand because God knows how to bring the right circumstances into our lives that will produce the right results that will end where we want to end and it's not always what we think God is going to do. Now God is, as we know from Scripture, infinitely wise. Psalm 147 verse 5, the psalmist writes, Great is our Lord and abundant in strength his understanding 
is infinite. And Solomon writes in Proverbs 3.19, the Lord by wisdom founded the earth, by understanding he established the heavens. We know that whatever God possesses, he possesses infinitely or to an infinite degree because that's what he is, an infinite being. Well, the same wisdom that designed the heavens and the earth, and the more we understand about the heavens and the earth, the more we see God's infinite wisdom in his design, that same wisdom is what the Lord used as he, as it were, planned out your life. God does have a plan, and it includes everything that takes place in your life. God that is not only infinitely wise, he not only has this comprehensive plan, but God tells us in his word that he is sovereignly working that plan out according to this wisdom and according to his power that he is in fact doing it. In other words, God is in control of all things. You need to believe that and you need to trust that God is working good through it. Now again, that God is absolutely sovereign is something we see shot throughout Scripture, but let me just give you a couple of examples. You remember Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and how uh, he somehow thought that this great city that he had built and this great kingdom and empire, which at the time was a world-dominating empire, he thought he had done that by himself, that that was his accomplishment. Well, the Lord taught him otherwise. He took away his intelligence and made him like a wild beast for a time to teach him that it really wasn't from him that these things took place, but Babylon was actually built by God. It was a part of his plan. Daniel writes uh, in Daniel 4, verses 34 through 35, of that revelation that dawned on Nebuchadnezzar when the Lord finally released him, as it were, from this predicament that he was in. But at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever. For His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but He does according to His will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth, and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? You see, God has a sovereign plan. God has an absolute plan. God is enacting that plan according to his will. And basically, nobody can say yes or no to it. God is going to do what he ha is planning to do, and nobody can stop him. Paul writes in Ephesians 1 verse 11, Also, we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. Now, God in his wisdom has planned out your life. God in his sovereignty is controlling not only the events of the world, but he's in control of the events of your life. And basically what Solomon is telling us to do is to trust that God has the wisdom to do what is good and what is best for you. And as a matter of fact, that is what he is doing if you will love him and serve him. As a matter of fact, you have the promise of God that that's exactly what he's doing. Regardless of what it is you have to face in this world, he is going to work it together for good. Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So the Lord is the one that you are to trust, and of course you are to trust that he has your well-being in mind if, in fact, you've trusted his son and are turning from your sins. And this trust that you are to have in him is to be with the entirety of your being, even as you're called to love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The Lord also calls upon you to trust him in all of the circumstances that you have to face, knowing that he is trustworthy, knowing that everything that he has planned, he has planned in infinite wisdom for your good, we are to go beyond just simply saying we trust the Lord, and we are to really trust him from the heart. We are to believe God when he speaks to us in his word and his promises. We need to trust that when God says he's going to meet our needs, that he will, in fact, meet all of those needs. 
we need to trust the Lord as we're going to see in just a moment during the good times and the bad times. It's easy to trust him in the good times, but also in the bad. We need to trust that God has our good in mind, that he is going to work the circumstances of your life together for good regardless of what they are. So even, you see, as I mentioned before, as you've trusted the Lord to save you, as you've entrusted your souls into his keeping for eternity to bring you to glory, you need to trust that he is going to work everything together in your lives for good, that he's going to take care of you. Yeah, here's an interesting argument that I think is valid. If you can actually trust the Lord with your soul, if you can do this greater thing, how can you not trust him? to take care of your needs while you're here in this world. Uh, Joseph Hall, who was a bishop in the Church of England in the 17th century, writes this, How shall I depend on him for raising my body from the dust and saving my soul at last if I distrust him for a crust of bread towards my preservation? But isn't that exactly what we do? You know, we always we look at the circumstances when they get difficult or when they're threatening and we say, is the Lord just going to let me be destroyed? Is he not going to provide for me? Am I not going to have everything that I need? And we, we begin to struggle with all these things. And yet, at the same time, we say, I am sure that God is going to protect my soul and he's going to keep it forever and bring me to heaven. And yet, God has given us promises for both of these things. If we're going to trust our souls to him, why not our bodies? The fact is, we need to learn to trust him if we're going to really feel any sense of security or comfort in this world. Thomas Manton, uh, one of the famous Puritans, writes this, if a man would lead a happy life, let him but seek a sure object for his trust and he shall be safe. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. He has laid up his confidence in God. Therefore, his heart is kept in an equal poise. So basically, if you're going to find happiness, if you're going to find contentment, if you're going to have any sense of security at all, you must learn to do what Solomon says here. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now again, that's easy to say, but it's a little bit more difficult sometimes to do because of the things that the Lord brings into our lives. I mean, life is not easy, is it? Which is why Solomon, as it were, follows up this statement with a second statement where he writes, do not lean on your own understanding. Now that's what Philip was tempted to do this morning as we saw in John 6, and that is in fact what he did. When Jesus said, where are we going to get the bread? He said, 200 denarii aren't enough for everyone even to have a little. That's just the opposite of the attitude the Lord calls us to have. I mean, how is this need going to be met is basically what Philip was saying. Well, when you have Jesus standing next to you, there really shouldn't be a question, right? I mean, Jesus is the one who can do whatever he desires because he had divine power at his disposal. Now, certainly not to lean on your understanding means that we, that all of us, are not to do the things in the way that we think is best. In other words, God tells us to go one direction and we go the other because we think that we know better than God. Don't lean on your own understanding in that regard because you know God's way is always best. But it also means that you are to trust what the Lord does in his providence, that is, in what he brings into your lives in how he allows the events of your life to fall out, in how the Lord answers your prayers. Because <clears throat> very often, the Lord seems to do just the opposite of what we just asked him to do, or you know, based on his promise, Lord, you've promised this, I've asked you for this, but you've brought this instead. Well, during times like that, and those times can be quite frequent, we do need to trust the Lord. Thomas Watson uh, who again was a Puritan of the uh, 17th century, uh, writes this very insightful statement. He says, God is to be trusted when his providences seem to run contrary to his promises. God promised David to give him the crown to make him king, but providence turns contrary to his promise. David was pursued by Saul, was in danger of his life, 
But all this while, it was David's duty to trust God. The Lord does oft times by cross providence bring to pass his promise. Uh, by the way, we should stop there and say, what happened? Did David become king? He did, right? Even though it looked like he was going to die. Okay, the Lord was faithful. He said, God promised Paul the lives of all that were with him in the ship. But now the providence of God seems to run quite contrary to his promise. The winds blow, the ship splits and breaks in pieces, and thus God fulfilled his promise upon the broken pieces of the ship. They all came safe to shore. Trust God when providences seem to run quite contrary to promises. And again, you don't have to look far in Scripture to see many more examples of this. I mean, just think about how God promised Joseph in a dream that his father and mother and his brothers were all going to bow down to him. But then what happens next? His brothers get jealous of him. They throw him into a pit. They want to kill him. Instead, they sell him as a slave into Egypt. He's put into Potiphar's house, and because he's unwilling to compromise with Potiphar's wife, he's thrown into prison. And from there, of course, we know that he interpreted the dreams of the men who were in prison with him and eventually interprets Pharaoh's dream. And because of that, he rose to second in command in Egypt so that his father, his mother, even though his, his particular mother was, was gone by that time, there were still... Um, Jacob's wife, and his brothers all bow down to him. As uh, we're reminded, sometimes God's providence runs contrary to his uh, promises. I think of one other example, you know how Paul was called by the Spirit of God to go and preach the gospel to the Gentiles. God made a promise to him that he would rescue him from the Jews and from the Gentiles, and yet... He met with a great deal of difficulty all along the way, was often persecuted, and on one occasion was even stoned to death. And yet, God was faithful to him, and Paul rejoiced in even all the difficulties that he had to face. In other words, when God makes a promise, it doesn't mean he's just going to make it easy for us in order to get it. Very often, the Lord brings things that go against what he has promised. In answering our prayers, because he is testing our faith. He wants to see whether or not we're going to trust him. If we will trust the Lord, if we will endure and continue to seek him, he will fulfill his promise to us. Uh, we need to make sure that we don't trust our interpretation of the situation, uh, think that God is not faithful, that he's not going to fulfill his promise, and simply give up. We must not as it were, lean on our own understanding, either of what God is doing or how we think God ought to do things. We need to trust Him. God is going to work what He said He would through these things. Now, thirdly, Solomon writes, in all your, your ways, acknowledge Him. As you're traveling through life, as the Lord takes, um, takes you basically through the things that He has planned for you, as you see his answers to your prayers, and especially when they happen to be answers that are seeming to go against his promises and against what it is you've just asked him to do, you need to recognize that this is God who is at work. This is his hand. This is the way he works. This is his plan that is unfolding and that his plan is good. You do need to acknowledge that and, as it were, acquiesce in that. You need to believe that God is going to work this together for good. You need to also see what it is that, that basically He is doing. You know, sometimes we just look at the, the bad things, as it were, or that, that seeming difficulty He's brought into our lives, and we don't see what it is that, that God is actually doing through that difficulty, the good things that He is bringing uh, out of this situation. So basically, you must not only believe that his hand is in sovereign control of everything that's happening, but even when it seems like everything is going against you, you need to acknowledge that this is his will, and you need to thank him. Remember how Paul says on one occasion, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I, when you understand that everything God brings into your life, even though it be difficult, is meant for your good, and he's going to work it together for good, then you can give him thanks in everything, even though some of the things that the Lord brings into our lives are not 
so good in and of themselves. And through these things, we also need to ask God for his counsel. We need to ask for his direction, his, his wisdom, as it were. Not only to know what to do when we don't know what to do, but also when it seems perfectly clear to us, we need to continually seek the Lord for his wisdom and his grace. So we do need to ask the Lord for his blessing. We do need to ask for success to do what he has called us to do. We need to be thankful when the Lord gives us that blessing to us. But we also need to realize when difficulties come because that is God's answer to prayer, we need to submit to that as well. And we need to keep our eyes on the Lord and trust again that he's going to bring good out of it. So at every step of the way, acknowledge this is the hand of God. This is his will. This is his answer to the prayer. And so we need to believe that it's, it's good. This is God's going to work good out of it. Now finally, if you do that, if you trust him, and if you don't lean on your understanding, your interpretation, but trust that what God said is true and he's going to bring good out of it, if you acknowledge him at every step of the way and thank him for the things he's brought, again, looking to what he's going to do through this, Solomon says he will make your paths straight. Basically, he is going to work his character in you. He's going to work holiness in you. Uh, you think about that passage in uh, Hebrews chapter 12 where uh, if we happen to make unstraight paths for our feet, the Lord will do what is necessary to bring us back into that path, which basically means he's going to help us to live a godly life. That's the, you know, the ultimate goal of his discipline. Well, this is another path, as it were, to stay on that path, to trust the Lord, to rely on him and basically know that he knows what he's doing and to acknowledge him. If we do that, God says he is going to make our path straight, which means he's going to work his character in us. He's going to work his holiness in us. He is going to help us to grow spiritually. He will make us usable, which is ultimately what we want to be. Now again, the path may not look like it's going the right direction, but we need to understand that God's ways are higher than ours. We need to believe that he knows far better than we do what it is we need. We need to believe that he knows how to answer the prayers that we prayed and to direct us in life to that right destination, to what it is he has promised for us. We need to trust that he knows what he's doing as he answers the prayer to make us more like Jesus. Now, as an illustration of this, let me just simply close by reading a uh, hymn by John Newton, which we weren't very familiar with for the first, you know, perhaps 19, 20 years of, at least of my time here, but um, have become <laughs> familiar with recently. And that is the hymn, I Ask the Lord That I Might Grow, because I think it's a perfect example. It just shows us, too, that John Newton understood what it is that we're talking about here and how oftentimes the Lord answers prayers in a way different than we th think he's going to. We need to know that this is the way he works and we need to trust him. Uh, Newton writes this, I ask the Lord that I might grow in faith and love and every grace, might more of his salvation know and seek more earnestly his face. Twas he who taught me thus to pray. And he, I trust, has answered prayer. But it has been in such a way as almost drove me to despair. I hope that in some favored hour at once he'd answer my request and by his love's constraining power subdue my sins and give me rest. Instead of this, he made me feel the hidden evils of my heart and let the angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part. Yes, more with his own hand he seemed intent to aggravate my woe. Crossed all the fair designs I schemed, blasted my gourds and laid me low. Lord, why is this? I trembling cried. Will you pursue your worm to death? Tis in this way, the Lord replied, I answer prayer for grace and faith. These inward trials I employ from self and pride to set you free and break your schemes of earthly joy that you might seek your all in me.
Now again, it reminds us, the Lord may not answer you know, your prayers, my prayers, in the way that we hope, but he will answer them in the way that we need, you see. And we can always trust God to do this because he's faithful. So next time you find yourself in a difficult situation, next time you're faced with trials, next time you pray and you ask God for more love and more faith and more grace and then you find yourself in the middle of a very difficult trial, just remember that this is how God actually deals with us. This is how he works. And we need to know it's how he works so that when we see it come, we know it's from his hand. Nothing happens outside of his control. We know he intends it for good. We need to let him work in our lives through those situations and let him, as it were, work that good in us because that is the way God knows that that prayer needs to be answered. That's how he's going to fulfill his promise. We just need to learn to trust in him. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a few moments of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us do exactly that.